Hello artists and welcome to day 51 of the 365 day effort journey. Today we're going to be discussing artistic license, but before I do that, some of you may have noticed I didn't post a video today, and I'm going to tell you what happened. Do what you wanna do. So day 51's video was delayed, you're never going to believe what I did. While I was busy doing the painting that was up here yesterday of Ronwin, the one that I posted yesterday, the day before yesterday, I had the image on my tablet and I had my tablet standing up on an easel. And I walked past my tablet at some point and my foot caught the easel and the tablet went flying and landed face down from quite a high height and that was the end of my tablet. It was shattered. I was devastated. And choose nuts on the same day I take the memory card out of my camera put it in my computer it was full of bits and pieces from all the constant recording and deleting so I formatted it didn't I so it wouldn't work in my camera anymore so yesterday I had neither a tablet nor a camera so I couldn't do any recording so I was stymied I ran around today getting my tablet sorted out and getting my, my card sorted out I had no idea what to do about the memory card I was gonna have to go and buy a new one but then after Asking Dr. Google, I figured out that it was just a couple of buttons that I needed to push and my memory card is working again. So I am back with day 51, so please forgive me for being a day late. So what we're going to be discussing today is artistic license. Now I've got my tablet in front of me with images, you're going to see them up on the screen next to me. But I want to discuss with you how important it is as an, as an artist to put your own stamp on the image that you're painting. I see it quite often and I'm, I'm sure you've also experienced it where an artist will paint exactly as per the image, the photograph that they've taken or where, whatever the source material is. If you're painting from life, of course, it's a t completely different story. But if you're painting from a photograph that you've taken, it's very easy to just duplicate the photograph, simply copy it onto your canvas. You're literally just rendering it without really giving a heck of a lot of thought to much else. It's a trap that one can fall into end up compromising the composition of the artwork that you're busy doing. Um, one of the most common things that I often say to my artists is that don't paint a juvenile lion. If you're going to paint a lion, paint either a cub or an adult lion because a juvenile lion has got a very moth-eaten mane and that translates into a painting as a painting that was badly done because the lion looks very adult but his mane is very moth-eaten and if you copy that mane exactly as per the photograph that you're working from then that lion appears to have a moth-eaten mane and because it's a painting it's subject to a certain amount of scrutiny that a photograph would not be subject to. If somebody saw a photograph of a juvenile lion with a moth-eaten mane it would be accepted as such because it's a photograph and cameras don't lie. But if you did a painting of a lion with a moth-eaten mane the first conclusion that people will jump to is that that lion has been badly painted. The artist didn't even bother to paint the mane properly. So as artists our work seems to be a little bit more judged in a lot of ways because it is open to a certain amount of scrutiny that photography isn't. There's, there's other examples I can use but I think that one is a pretty good example to explain what I mean. You need to manipulate your artwork and add your creative context to it. To explain to you what I'm talking about here I'm going to take you through a couple of paintings that I've done. I know this is going to sound a little bit narcissistic of me but I've only got my own work to use as reference here because I can show you the photographs that I worked from com in comparison to the final artwork. I can't do that with other artists work. I don't have access to their photographs. So the first one that we're going to have a look at is a glazed portrait that I did of my daughter Ronwin. Now I've spoken about it before. Ronwin is very happy to model for me so a lot of these photographs that I'm going to show you now are of Ronwin. And in fact, the painting that I completed the day before yesterday for you guys was also of Ronwin from, a, from the same photo shoot. We did a photo shoot at the Botanic Gardens in Durban and I got a lot of beautiful material to work from. So this photograph that you can see here is a glazed painting that I did. This is the one that's going to appear in the South African Artist Magazine in issue number 22 as a glazed demo. Now you can see by the difference between the photograph and the painting that all I've really done is cropped into it. Okay, The photograph was taken a lot further out. All I've really done is cropped it, close cropped her face. I haven't changed much else. What I have done however is that I've exaggerated colors. Now that seems to be something that I do but in this particular case I exaggerated them on purpose because of the beauty that glaze lends to a painting. I get all the greens on the side of her face nicely exaggerated 
um, to show the reflection of the light because she was sitting underneath the shade of a tree and all those the reflections of all the green around her was reflecting beautifully off of her skin and that's the nice thing about glazing is that kind of subtlety and color can come across really well the next picture that we're going to have a look at is also Ronrin, also at the same photo shoot now with this particular one i took my cue from the dress that she was wearing she had this sort of strange minty not even quite minty green dress on and then of course she was sitting also under the shade of a tree so there was quite a lot of reflection on her from that and i've really exaggerated the colors in this one now this is not a glazed painting but what i wanted to show you here was the exaggeration of color now if you look at her, her forehead how very pink the pinks are and how very green the greens are now that i've done to exaggerate the ambience of the ambient lighting around her i've also exaggerated a little bit not a heck of a lot but i've exaggerated a little bit the light that's falling on the side of her face particularly the light shining through her hair and reflecting onto the side of her nose in fact my youngest daughter calls this the zebra painting ronwin the zebra because it's quite exaggerated now this painting you've also seen once before it was a violinist that i encountered at early one morning at the farmer's market he was standing outside where i was with one or two of the other artists and playing the violin and i just really enjoyed how the light was dancing on his face and, and particularly on the back of his neck because i was sitting behind him and again the colors here are quite exaggerated but have a look at what i've done with the background we spoke about this when we were talking about the imprimatura layer in one of the previous videos but i've completely ignored his surroundings and i've concentrated entirely on the light and as the light is striking his face so again colors are quite exaggerated in fact, what you're seeing on the screen is probably a little bit brighter than what it appears to be in real life. It, it photographed a little bit like that. But they are quite a lot more exaggerated than what, it, what he was in the, um, in the image. You can also see I've exaggerated some of the blue light on the reflections on the side of his nose and on the, on the opposite side of his face from where the light is. And I've exaggerated some of the blue that's reflecting out of the violin. The reason I did this was because I wanted to communicate that particularly bright, cool light that was coming through and landing on him in that early morning shoot. I also really liked the way that the, the early morning light and shadows danced off the violin. So I tried to bring across also that the, the juxtaposition of warm and cool on that violin as well. So again, what I've done there is I've taken a photograph and I've played with it to the point that I can make it my own in terms of the color because it was not only am i wanting to paint what i'm seeing but i wanted to paint what i was feeling on that day standing watching him and enjoying the light on his face i wanted to bring that across to it as well and that is the good thing about painting from life or painting from photographs that you've taken yourself is that when you're doing the painting it's not only about reproducing the artwork it's about reproducing the moment and that moment can be reproduced in more than simply just the artwork or the photograph that you've taken it can be reproduced by what you feel was important at that particular moment and in this case it was the light on his face so i exaggerated that because that was the feeling from which i was painting now this painting is a very dear friend of mine his name is craig Craig and his wife Debbie and my husband and I are great friends together with another couple. This particular day we'd gone to the Portuguese club in Durban with the other friend of ours. The six of us were together because the, the um, female of the other relationship, um, Annabella, is a Portuguese lady. And we often go every year on Portuguese day and go and have lunch at the Portuguese club um, to help her celebrate her day of independence in Portugal. And Craig was sitting opposite the table to me and behind him was this large window and there was this beautiful lighting soft lighting because it was um, it was filtered light almost on the side of his face and he was actually sitting chatting to my husband my husband was there on his right and he was chatting to my husband and he was so in, in, engrossed in the conversation that he was having with my husband that he had this this he's very fond of john and this the photograph really showed you know him, how he was listening intently to john and i just saw in his face and I think possibly this is an arty thing that when we look, especially if you're a portrait artist like myself, when you look at people's faces, you're looking at more than just the person. You're looking at, at, at how the lines fall, how the light falls on his face. And this is what I was seeing that day was how this back lighting almost was completely lighting up the one side of his face. And the other side of his face was quite flat in shadow. And I wanted to communicate that as well. And if you can see, if you have a look in this painting, I took my cue of the background colour from the lighting that is on his left hand side, that, that white wall that has gone quite greeny grey. I took my cue of the imprimatura layer from that. 
I also haven't bothered to paint any of his hair. Um, and I think that was probably because his hair is just context. I, I wanted the focus of attention to be entirely on his face and that expression that he's, that he's holding as he's listening to John because that is just so Craig and it captured so beautifully uh, the relationship between John and Craig. You'll also notice in this painting that the colors are again exaggerated. That seems to be something that I do. I exaggerate colors. I think color is just such an important component of our artwork and we can really lift color to make it our own and, and to set it apart almost from a relatively flat photograph as, as this one was in this particular case. So I lifted all those colors. This photograph that you can see here again it's of Ronwin when, when we were in the garden that day. Now this is a, a great example of how I looked at the photograph and decided I needed more to it. Her on her own wasn't enough. It would have been a fun painting, it would have been great, but I wanted more. I wanted a lot more of the lighting falling on, the, on her right shoulder, across her shoulder. I wanted more dappled and mottled effect. And I could have brought in some of the dappleness from the trees above her and um, associated those dapples to the leaves that are above her head. But I actually chose rather to put an umbrella into the painting. So all I did is I just went onto the internet and I just googled parasols and I found a couple of parasols that I really liked and I used them as reference. But of course once I had put a parasol into the painting I needed to move her arm because as you can see in the photograph her left arm is hanging down and I needed to put her arm up holding the parasol. So I simply moved her arm. <laughs> I didn't, I chose not to paint exactly what I saw. I chose you know, when I was looking at the photographs, I thought, Don, how cool would it have been if she had a parasol in her hand, rather? And how cool would the lighting have been? And, and it would have been a nicer element. So rather than just wishing that I had it, I created it. I put her arm up. I had to do a little bit of, I asked her to stand in front of me so I could do a sketch of her arm in that position holding the parasol. So I had to do a little bit of investigating. But basically the coloring and the lighting on her arm is guesswork relative to the rest of the painting. So that is a pretty good example of how I manipulated that uh, painting to be the composition that I wanted it to be. Another thing that I also did when I was painting it, I decided that I needed some offset color balance. You know, we've, we've talked about balance and leading lines and all different compositional elements some videos ago. And this was a case where I decided it needed more to pull the eye into the subject matter. So I added some more color balance by putting those flowers down on the, on the bottom left hand side of the painting. Now the, as you can see in the original photograph those flowers aren't there, the foliage is there. But those photographs were elsewhere in the garden in bloom at the time so it did make sense to put them into the painting and I took the color of those flowers from what I had seen on that day as well as the shape and um, and the, the green foliage that is around them as well is relative to the type of, I don't even know what kind of flower it is, I'm not into botany, but it, it made sense because I knew that those flowers were in bloom in that area on the same day and that, that that type of foliage belonged to that flower. So you've kind of got to know that what you're doing makes sense. Also you can see what I've done in this painting is that the background behind her headspace, that far distant grassy effect, I've just blurred out completely. I haven't painted in any great detail. And that is to draw attention to the foreground and to the subject matter which is Ronwin herself. Another thing that I did as well is I added more highlights to the foliage that is on her left and I also added much more dappleness onto the, the walkway that she's walking on. In this case I wanted to communicate that, that gentle always afternoon kind of feeling that um, like a walk on the beach would give you. But in this case it was a walk in the botanic gardens. Again this is a, a photograph that I painted from or a series of photographs that I painted from that we took on the same day. As you can see there were three photographs that we used to create this painting. The two bottom photographs were photographs that I took knowing at the time that I was going to use them together. I didn't zoom out far enough to get her whole head to feet into the photograph. I did that on purpose because I wanted to make sure that I was getting enough detail into the photographs. But afterwards when I was sitting producing the painting, I just wanted there to be something below her. I didn't want the painting to just end at her feet. So I then went through all my photographs to see what else there could be that I could use. And then the top photograph, the one that I've got on top there, um, I focused my attention on that because I could see that that water was going to be a lovely foreground element and I also had her foot and it happened to be the, the correct foot because that's something that you also have to be careful of when you're doing something like this. I could very easily have inadvertently given her two left or two right feet without realizing that it was possibly the wrong foot but fortunately the feet matched. 
I also then took the dog, inverted him and put him on the other side of her. So I've taken elements from various different photographs and put them together into one composition. Unfortunately, I don't think that this particular painting photographed very well. I might have to re-photograph it because it's come out quite orange. It doesn't really look like that in real life. Um, but again, my colors are exaggerated. So what is my point in all of this? My point is this. As an artist, you have completely free reign to manipulate your artwork to be as you choose it to be. You can, for example, be sitting outdoors and doing a plain air painting and decide that the tree would do better in a different place. So you can just move it. Um, you don't have to paint exactly what you see. You don't have to simply render the artwork. This is one of the ways that knowing all the rules of art, all those principles of art that we talked about in the first in, in that three week period can actually come into play because you can if you learned the Fibonacci numbers and, and the, the Fibonacci spiral, if you learned about compositional leading lines, perspective, etc., all of those things that we discussed, you can pull elements from your original, move things around and create the composition that you're looking for without necessarily affecting the final outcome of being able to represent a particular person or a particular place. You could go to the opposite extreme and make it quite an abstract and almost non-representative painting by doing the same thing, completely exaggerating all the elements that you're seeing in, in every way, shape, color, etc. to create the painting that you want. As an artist, I don't want people to look at my paintings and say they look like photographs. I've discussed this once before. I want my piece to be a, a painting that is an artistic piece, not simply a rendering of a photograph that I have taken. That is a privilege that we enjoy as artists, that we can do that, as opposed to photographers who have to manipulate a scene before they photograph it. And we can manipulate it as we please in a way that suits the compositional style that we are trying to communicate. And that's what makes us individuals as artists. We can put our thumbprint on our style by everything from the way we use our brush, the colors that we choose, as well as the compositional elements that we rearrange to suit what it is that we are trying to create as an artist. These paintings that I referred to today I will put onto the album so that you can go and have a look at them with their originals so that you can do some comparison. So artists, what I'm trying to get across to you today is simply this. You are the artist, you make the decisions and you can change things even if in real life it looks one way, you can change it to be the way that you want and that goes for landscapes as well. You can move a mountain or move a tree, put it where you want it to be to make the composition work the way that you want it to work. Simply rendering a photograph exactly as you see it is not necessarily always the best way to go. If, that's, if that photograph that you're working from is exactly how you want to paint it, that's fine. Always look at your source material, whether it be life or a photograph, as a suggestion. This is something that you want to create. How can you improve upon it? Is it possible to improve? It may not be. You may decide that it's fine as it is. But always consider the fact that you might get a better composition if you moved an element because that is your right as an artist. You're the artist, you've got the artistic license only. Nobody else has got the artistic license that you have got. You've got that artistic license and use it to your full potential. Change what you feel needs to be changed if you feel it needs to be changed because that is your work of art and you own it 100%. You own the responsibility of creating that piece of art. So create it the way that you feel will best represent what it is you're trying to communicate with it. So artist, I apologize for not having brought you day 51 yesterday. I'm too busy running around trying to sort out my very broken tablet and my very formatted uh, mini card. But I do hope that I've more than made up for it with this talk. And I hope that you will like and share and subscribe. And I'm hoping that nothing will go wrong tomorrow, that I will see you tomorrow for day 52. Thank you for joining me. Goodbye. That's what you want to do.